Uh, my name is Paul Grandal. I'm the Opalka Endowed Director of the New York State Writers Institute at the University of Albany. We're so glad you're here for our fifth edition of Telling the Truth. As I mentioned, Bookhouse is out front. And a reminder of the ground rules, the first panel and the audience questions stuck to the ground rules, which are a question, make it brief, not a time for statements and political diatribes. We uh, really want to be, it was very respectful, um, and we want that to continue for this session. So I'll quickly introduce our panelists and our moderator for this second panel that we're calling the American Backlash. Our first panelist is Juliet Hooker. She is the Royce Family Professor of Teaching Excellence in Political Science at Brown University. Her previous books included Theorizing Race in the Americas, which was awarded the American Political Science Association's 2018 Ralph Bunch Book Award for Best Book on Ethnic and Cultural Pluralism. Her most recent book published this year, which will be the focus of tonight's panel, is titled Black Grief, White Grievance, The Politics of Loss. Please welcome Juliet Hooker. Our second panelist is Jeff Charlotte, a journalist, best-selling author, and endowed professor in the art of writing at Dartmouth College. His reporting on LGBTQ plus rights around the world earned him a National Magazine Award, the Molly Ivins Prize, and Outright International's Outspoken Award. He's the author and editor of several books, most recently the one we'll discuss tonight, The Undertow, Scenes from a Slow Civil War. Please welcome to the stage Jeff Charlotte. And our moderator for this panel, Libby Post, the founder and president of Communication Services, a political communications firm. She is well known for her sustained advocacy on behalf of the LG LGBTQ plus community and as the founder of the Empire State Pride Agenda. She's also familiar to the audience here as a frequent commentator on the Roundtable on WAMC. Please welcome Libby Post. Juliet and Jeff, thank you for making your way to Albany um, and this historic place, Page Hall. It's a lovely, we used to do lesbian concerts here. Mm. You know, back in the day when there were a lot of lesbians in town. So, <laughs> so both of your books are about grievance politics, right? And I call it cage match politics, you know? And we almost had that on the floor of Congress yesterday or the day before. It's all emotion and brute force and no real rationale other than feeling deprived of, and then we can just fill in the blank, what everybody feels deprived of. So can each of you share a little bit about why you wrote your book and what you hope if everyone is going to buy a copy of it, right, mm -hmm. um, what they'll be able to take away from it. So Juliet. Yeah, of course. Um, so first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. I went to college actually not too far away um, in Williamstown. Um, uh, so I wrote this book because I started writing the book actually after Ferguson. And I was watching, like many of us, what had happened there, you know, the death of Mike Brown, the, the way in which protesters were being policed, um, uh, you know, disproportionately and, and really taken to task for their anger and, and, and their pain. And, and that led me to start thinking about how, um, how people perceive black activists and black protesters who are looking for justice for their, um, for their loved ones. And as 2016 progressed, then the Trump uh, campaign heated up. And of course, there was this, this racist, sexist, anti-immigrant rhetoric that became very central to it. And that got me to thinking about white grievance and how it was really being mobilized um, in that campaign, in that moment. And so really the book came out of me realizing that there are these, these were two examples of ways in which people were mobilizing around loss. In one case, right, a, a sort of very deadly 
material loss, the loss of a, of a life, and in the other, to some extent, anticipatory losses, right? This perception that the United States was changing and people were being displaced and wanting to preemptively hold on to, to their rightful place. And so the book really came out of that sense that we needed to think about these two things at the same time um, and, and to make sense of them in relation to each other. Um, and I, I guess what I hope people will, will take from it is, a, is a, an understanding of, you know, often people um, can be aggrieved and resentful and make their claims, but that thinking about loss in this way might help us to think about which losses we need to attend to um, as fellow citizens in a democracy. Jeff? Yeah, um, I, I think, uh, so I've been, one of the theme currents running through, through my books, I've been writing about right-wing movements around the United States, around the world for 20 years, and, uh, and trying to understand it as a social movement. One of those terms that sometimes we um, liberals are on the left, think belongs to us, but the right has social movements too, and social movements grow, and uh, what I saw in 2016 was the beginning of a convergence of right-wing social movements that hadn't been talking to one another very, very well before. Um, and so I set out to make one book, and uh, was sort of ready, almost felt like I was done with it, and then January 6, 2021, and I was watching it, uh, in real time, as I think many of us were, and uh, despite having said this could happen for so many years, still, I mean, I was on the phone with my wife, who was sledding with my kids, and saying, no, they're marching toward the Capitol, they're outside the Capitol, they're inside the Capitol, and then, bang, and there was the shot that killed a 30-something-year-old 30, uh, white woman named Ashley Babbitt, who was leading a charge, a Trump flag wrapped like a cape around her. She had leapt up into a window, leading a charge. She was there, I can put aside all, she was armed and she was there to storm the Capitol. Um, and we see the hands on the video, there's many videos, but the one that played that very day of the officer who shot her and they were the hands of a black man. And I said, oh, this is going, this is going to be a theological shift in Trumpism, not that they are discovering racism and white supremacy, but now they have the martyr that they have been looking for, and that they're entering an age of martyrdoms because the story of white womanhood killed by especially a black man um, uh, is as old as the United States. It's the lynching story. And so I set out, I said, I said this martyr myth is going to form and it's gonna make this movement m even more dangerous, and so I'm going back on the road to find out what I can about it, because I'm counterphobic, and that sort of soothes me when I'm very anxious, is I'll just go and knock on the door of the militia man, and that way he can't surprise me, because I'm here first. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a little scary. <laughs> so, you know, all of this, I think, has been brewing beneath the surface in the, in the United States forever. I don't. I don't think it's ever really gone away, but, you know, was it that Donald Trump unleashed this, or was it purely the fact that Barack Obama was elected and there was a black man in the White House? Well, I have one answer to that. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I argue about in my book is that white grievance is not new, right? That this, this refusal to accept loss um, has the backlash to what are perceived as, as gains by, um, um, by African Americans has been a kind of recurring feature um, in U.S. political development. You know, um, we saw, oh, for example, after the gains of the 1960s, the, um, the backlash to, um, to that moment after the Civil War to Reconstruction. So white grievance, what, um, um, you know, white backlash are not new. What I would say is that I do think that Obama's presidency was a really important moment. You know, for some people, even though Obama was a, you know, pretty mainstream Democrat who was committed to transcending race, um, that fact of having a black president was deeply dislocating. It was a very important symbolic 
laws. And I mean, and, and if you think about it, right after Obama's presidency, you get the Tea Party, which we now forget about, right? Mm -hmm. But um, the Tea Party's slogan of take our country back, like, who are we taking the country back from? Who was we? Who was they that we're taking it back from? I mean, there are all these ways in which I think, um, you know, I, I, it, in trying to, to think about what that represented, and we've all, I think, forgotten some of it, but in Fox News, they would sometimes have these images of King Obama, right? This idea that having a black president somehow meant that um, there was this sort of rampant anti-white um, uh, racism that was um, pervasive. So I really think that that, that really intensified um, the, the feeling of displacement and the need to, um, to and the mobilization of a certain sense of, of victimhood it on the really, right. Yeah, it's really sort of a zero-sum game way of looking at life, um, mm -hmm. and that's, that's the way they were. Um, Jeff, you know, you've written a lot about all these people that have come out of the, I call it coming out of the woodwork. You know, they were always there, but they were, you know, in, in the woodwork. You know, what do you think? Was it Trump or was it Obama? Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think, I, I think, to answer that, I sort of have to define a term. And, and in this book, there's a footnote in which I said I was really wrong in another book. In 2008, I wrote a book called The Family, and it's about a very old organization, which we could call loosely Christian nationalists. Um, and there's a chapter called The F Word, which is fascism. Um, and I argued these guys who, in post-World War II, were actually recruiting former high-ranking Nazi war criminals. And the ones they couldn't get in the United States, they would fly US congressmen to go over and take counsel with. Nonetheless, I said they were not fascists. There's more than one kind of bad under the sun. Um, they did not, were not structurally fascist. And I said, more, I don't think that kind of full-fledged fascism is possible in America precisely because of the presence of the Christian fundamentalist tradition, the unwillingness to switch out, as this organization said, you can join us, but you gotta switch out the Fuhrer for the Father. You gotta, you, you can't have a cult of personality around a living person. Well, Donald Trump does prove that wrong, coming down that golden escalator, bringing the aesthetic of fascism. Would it be received? And yes, it was. But I think, I think the first, this, I wanted to define that because I wanted to say the first lie of fascism is inevitability. This was always coming. And uh, I think that's not true, even as we can say um, uh, 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 that lynching story I just mentioned, it's the central story of the template of Hollywood, Birth of a Nation, D.W. Mm -hmm. Griffiths, 1915, the first movie screened in the White House. A white woman flees a black man, and rather than succumb to his ravishing leaps to her death, at which point our heroes, literally, literally the Ku Klux Klan, ride to the rescue. Woodrow Wilson says, let's have a movie in the White House. Um, so that, that's as old, and you could sort of say, oh, that, that was always coming. But I, I just, if Franklin had a great line about, what was it, uh, politics is very rarely about our best hopes. Um, but political imagination is. Um, and I think, I think, so Trump was not inevitable. Um, I don't, I think, but it does begin well before Trump. That's sort of what I mean by the undertow, the currents that have been pulling us toward this place that Trump was able to gather together. Um, he didn't invent it. Uh, he is surfing that, that, that current, um, but he is not in inevitable even now. You know, I, I keep saying on the radio that there are no more World War II vets in Congress. Hmm. And with those voices, those were people who actually fought against yeah. fascism. My dad fought in the war, you know, they, they were there and they, they were sort of a stopgap against that. And once they're gone, there's nobody there to, to say no. You know, yeah. to, to somebody like that. So, Juliet, the, you talk about the politics of refusal and as a central mm -hmm. theme in your book, and you're not saying to abandon politics or retreat, but to abandon the notion of repair, mm -hmm. right, uh, as the only option because it only shores up white democracy, um, to refuse to exchange black suffering for white identification. How is that now being played out in the background of ongoing police violence against people of color? Clarence Thomas as sort of the white supremacist saying, look, we got a black guy on the, uh, on the Supreme Court, he's okay, right? Um, how is that all, you know, 
playing out, and what do you consider the most insidious of the various movements that you talk about in your book? Well, that's a, a very good question. So. I talk about this question of, I also talk about political imagination in the book because part of what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say is that, um, you know, there is a way in which the, even the way in which we talk about what's happening now with U.S. democracy looks differently if we actually look at the experience of um, people of color, African Americans, for example, others who have not achieved still full um, full citizenship, right? So the, the, even the, the language of black ba backsliding assumes that we had achieved full democracy, but we're still fighting for rights for any number of people, and there are people whose rights are routinely violated um, and, um, and who still can't express themselves to the same degree. If you think about the ways in which, you know, um, for example, Texas, a state I used to live in, the way in which um, there are all of these you know, um, expansion of ability to actually vote, right, that have been taken away, so you can't vote by mail, you only have like two drop boxes in the whole city of Houston, which is enormous. I mean, all these ways in which people still, this isn't still a functioning democracy. So part of my point about um, repair is sometimes I think there's a tendency to say, all we need to do is get back to normal. We can just get people to follow the rules again and have the guardrails in place and we'll be fine. But I think from the perspective of, you know, some citizens, actually we need some more fundamental transformations than that. We need to think very seriously about representation, right, the ways in which the the very structure of the Senate, um, the, um, you know, functions to um, give greater voice to some than to others. There's all of these things that we that are have become sacred cows that are not serving us well. And if we limit our imagination to simply let's get back to you know pre-Trump when people were kind of following the rules more or less, I think we're 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 just doing ourselves a disservice. You know, I I I just find it interesting that this notion of, oh, let's just go back to the way we were, right, and everything will be mm -hmm. fine again, mm -hmm. and A, we can never go back to the way we were, but things weren't fine. Things weren't fine, and they uh, haven't been fine for hundreds of years. Um, people of color routinely denied their rights to vote, as well as the ability to make a living and all the rest of the stuff that we know about, and LGBT people, I know, Jeff, you really work, do a lot of writing on, uh, on those issues. You know, the trans issue now, yeah. You know, we, the trans community has become the big bogeyman yeah. um, for the right. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I keep, I get all the lesbian and gay news, you know, alerts and stuff, and it, there's always at the top the trans issues, the, the dad who goes to the school board meeting, which happened a couple of weeks ago, and said, you're, you're, you're really hurting my daughter, and the school board, like, sorry, but we don't like her, you know? Mm -hmm. so, what do we do around those issues? How do we deal with people on those issues where they really don't understand? They really don't get it, and all it is is it, it, the, the, the hatred for lesbians and gays that was in this country in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and then when AIDS came, things sort of shifted a bit. Now that hatred is really focused on the trans community. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, it's a, actually a regret about the book is that I don't write much about that despite having written about LGBTQ issues in the United States and elsewhere uh, for a long time, the centrality of it to the right wing imagination. And I will say that term political imagination, I do not mean isn't it wonderful and we're going to make, because there's, there's nasty imaginations too and they're not trying to go back. And I think about, for instance, um, uh, some years ago I reported in Uganda, which is a U.S. proxy power in the region, and they decided to pass something with Ameri not American government backing, American organizational backing, uh, something called, uh, uh, very subtly, the Kill the Gays Bill. Mm -hmm. And it was openly genocidal in its ambition, and I know that because I spent a lot of time with the author. He says, that's the goal, and we hope this spreads all over Africa. It got pushed back for 10 years, it just passed this year, and people said, oh, they're going backwards. No, they weren't. 
Nothing like that had ever existed in Uganda. Mm. In fact, they were overriding centuries of not very ideal, but ways of sort of saying, okay, this, these people are real, and coming up with a utopian idea. And so this is, I think, when we think about the right and, and how they're embracing this kind of campaign against trans, uh, trans people, but especially trans kids, they're, they found a way. How do you punch a kid? This is how, right? Um, I think the, they're imagining a different society, not one that has existed. They say they're going backwards, but they are imagining forward. And you see that if you veer into their world. And you know, I, I traveled over uh, uh, Wisconsin after Roe fell, talking to um, people who were celebrating its fall, and I heard so many fascinating and completely fictional ideas about human reproductive biology. <laughs> it's incredible. The same with, 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 with trans issues. Um, I think, though, the one thing that I always sort of want to say, um, uh, and especially to crowds that I assume to be sort of liberal left, is you can't think about, oh, it's terrible what's happening to the trans people. It's terrible what's happening over there. Because the one thing that will resolve this, they're not, the trans kids are not going to stay the forefront of fascism's focus. Fascism needs new material. It will keep going, finding more and more enemies within. So if, you, if we sit there and look at this and say, that's terrible, I want to help them, we're doomed. If we say we're going to stand in solidarity and that every library that has a line of men with guns outside, as happens around the United States, you know, on a monthly or even weekly basis now, that's a which side are you on kind of deal. You could say, well, these issues are complicated. Are you with the guys with the guns or are you in with the kids in the library? Because that's, that's the position that, that we find ourselves in. Yeah. It's uh, watching the, what goes, I'm on a library board now, and it's a little, little, teeny, tiny little library mm -hmm. in Minneapolis. It's the first village north of here, and we've been relatively lucky so far, but the Bethlehem Library did a drag queen story time, and the community came out and surrounded the library mm -hmm. with love and right. holding hands around the library so that anybody who wanted to couldn't, and to disrupt couldn't get in. On the other hand, in Lake Luzerne, they wanted to do a drag queen story time, and the entire library now is closed. Yeah, because of that. Because of that, um, yeah. and it's really it's it's the the assault of libraries. I used to say I do animal work, and I used to say puppies and kittens in libraries were the last bastion of democracy. <laughs> now it's just puppies and kittens. <laughs> now it's just puppies because right. libraries have been politicized. Um, so, Juliet, you know, can you? Talk more about um, the politics of loss, how this is being wrought on people of color across the country, um, this notion of a zero-sum game where, oh, you know, you're taking my job. Oh, are you a doctor? Right? Mm -hmm. You know, are you an academic? Are you, no, we're not taking your jobs, you know? And, and the fact of the matter is that there are so many jobs and people don't want to take them. So can you talk a little bit more about the, 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 their feeling of necessity of having to feel that they have grievance and then how that plays out into how people in the, in the black community respond and can, can hopefully garner some political power? Yeah. So one of the things that I, I talk about in the book is that I say that you know one of the the features of, of white grievance is having a, a zero sum view of politics where it's not um, you know because in democracy of course we all lose we've all had the experience one of our, our preferred candidate doesn't win um, you know we're it's supposed to be um, you know a system where the same people don't win all the time. But I think one of the things that that you see when you look at the sense of displacement that people who are animated by racial resentment or other forms of resentment are is the sense that a win um, or a gain for other people is a loss for them, even if it doesn't affect their rights in any way. So one, you know, I think a good example of this is, is marriage equality, right? The people who were upset about that, but it wasn't taking anything away from their marriages to have, um, you know, gay folks be able to marry as well, right? But it was felt as a 
you know, this kind of dislocating thing. And so I think that 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 what that does is it feeds into the sense that you have to respond by aggressively reasserting the priority of your group, right? Um, and I think what it has what it has meant in in part, I think, for um, for folks who have not been part of the dominant group is that you're always having to do this work to say, um, you know, the broader public needs to care about my losses or my suffering, that you can't take for granted that people will display the same kind of care and concern for, for your losses. So there's this added burden of the kind of work that you have to do to kind of prove your humanity so that people will say, oh, there's someone who's like me and I should care about the, the suffering that they're, that they're dealing with. And that's an added burden, that's an added cost. And so part of what, um, you know, I think it's, is, um, is important there to think about is that yes, people do that kind of heroic activism all the time, right, to, to, to kind of get the rest of us to care about, you know, about the suffering of, of those who are not like us, but that in itself is a loss. Okay. Jeff, I, I found um, you're talking about the fragility of white men really fascinating because it's something I've been living with for a really long time as a lesbian. I'm like, okay, well, you know, no, I don't want to sleep with you and I'm sorry. Um, and don't, don't, it's not about you. Well, it is about you, but it's really not about you. But, f you know, they, there are chapters in the book about the incels and the need to dominate women mm -hmm. and, and even to enter women on their own terms, um, which is also called rape, um, uh, to being modern day's messiah through the Christian right's new gospel of prosperity, right, to January 6th and the threat of another Trump presidency. How do you think this is going to all play out? as we uh, <laughs> approach election day? And both of you can answer that question. How do you think it's going to play out? I mean, I'm, I... I kind of avoid most electoral questions. I'm impressed by uh, my former colleague Jay Rosen, who's a media critic and, and um, very vocal in sort of saying uh, what we need to pay attention to are a very simple little formulation, the stakes, not the odds. I could care less about Nikki Haley's numbers. Um, I care about um, whether it's Trump or, as Miles says, Trump or Trump point two. What matters there is the stakes, not the, the personality game and the transformation such that we were, we've, we've made several mentions of the senator who uh, offered to, to fist fight the Teamster president. It's Mark Wayne Mullins from Oklahoma. And I don't know Mark Wayne, um, uh, but I do know that Mark Wayne, after he was on January 6th, one of the people who was saying, he, he was saying, the cop who shot Ashley Babbitt, I was there and I understand and I'll vouch for him that that woman was attacking. And uh, that did him terrible damage in MAGA. Um, so my guess is that offer for a fight, that was performative. That was, that was auditioning for, you know, Secretary of Homeland Security or something like that under Trump too. Um, the fact that it's performative doesn't matter to me. And I think uh, the stakes, not odds, help us differentiate. There's a term that we often hear in the political press. We call something just leader. Well, as an arts person, I'm offended. What do you mean, just theater? Theater is powerful. And right now, we have a fascist movement. Fascism begins as an aesthetic. It grows out of futurism, an Italian arts movement in early 20th century, other sources, but that's one of them that understands that theater is powerful. So uh, I think we're in for a terrible, terrible show. Um, I, I think... Um, what do I think is going to happen? I think it's going to be awful. I think we're, the subtitle of the book is A Slow Civil War, and I think that's what we're in. It's a slow civil war. It's not the blue and the gray. It's the everyday violence. It's the people, pregnant people who are dying for want of reproductive rights. It's the epidemic of trans and queer suicide that has many sources, but one of them is, uh, and I've seen this in my own family, kids terrified. You can't tell them you're being paranoid when half the states are trying to criminalize you. Um, so there's that little violence simmering, 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 and I think um, we're gonna see more of that. Uh, electorally, the odds, I don't know. Um, 
I also leave the the predictive parts of um, to my empir my colleagues in political science who do empirical work. Um, I guess what I would would say is I think um, so. I think what we're seeing right now is 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 in some ways the you know I think the thing that for me is is very worrying besides Trump and his plans for his um, um, you know, second administration, is the, the growing group of, of people who are taking the position that if they don't win, they're willing to dispense with democracy. You know, I was very struck after the Ohio referendum when there was a, um, a, an um, anti-abortion campaigner who after it said, well, you know, maybe we, we don't, maybe so much direct democracy is not a good thing. And the ways in which, right, a lot of these states where referendums have been successful, um, the legislature is now trying, or are, are now trying to say, maybe we need to rethink right. those forms. And not to say that they're perfect, but to me, there is the, you know, it's not just the leaders, it's the danger are the folks who are convinced that, that um, that they um, that there is some sort of apocalyptic, you know, outcome on the horizon, and that therefore whatever they need to do to prevent that from happening is fair game. And I think there are a lot of people who are animated by that that fear and that vision, and 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 that is um, is is I think really really frightening. Where does the apocalypse that vision come from? I'm going to let you take the crack at that first. <laughs> well, there's a pale horse, you see, and a beast with many. Um, I mean, yeah, it does come from Revelation, but it comes from many places. And you know, there's uh, apocalypse is one of those interesting sort of bits of political imagination. Um, it's a terrific book, the title of which I'm blanking on. Um, uh, see, I'm like Joe Biden. Um, uh, <laughs> no, no, uh, no, you're um, fine, and so is he. Um, on the importance of apocalyptic. Uh, theology and the struggle for freedom in South Africa, right? So apocalyptism can often take the form of this is a situation we have to confront this. It's not always right wing, but the beginning of the book is called Our Condition. And in it, I kind of want to say um, we're vulnerable to apocalypse thinking too, right? When we speak of the crisis of democracy, when we speak of the climate crisis, I pay attention. I spend a lot of time not just with uh, right-wing folks and fascists, but also paying attention to their language, paying attention to the intellectuals who are, your, you're absolutely right, Patrick Deneen at Notre Dame, Adrian Vermeule at Harvard, are now sort of saying, wait a minute, maybe democracy, uh, maybe we don't need that, maybe we can come up with something better. But that word crisis, which of course has a deep history and the black American struggle as well, I think is very vulnerable to the fascist co-optation. And I think that's when we say where's apocalypse comes from, it comes from all of our sense of crisis. Think about it for a moment though. Crisis is a narrative term. It suggests here comes a crisis and there's gonna be a resolution. We might mm -hmm. win or we might lose. Does that describe our climate condition? Maybe we'll get those glaciers back. No, we won't. This is the condition we live with. Maybe we'll get that democracy, we'll vote for Joe Biden, we'll get that democracy back. No, this is our condition. We will never again even have the veneer of being able to say we live in a country of peaceful transition. We don't have that. That's the condition. So I think that apocalypse, I'm gonna say in a very kind of new agey way, it comes from within. Um, uh, but uh, it comes from within us and we're all vulnerable to it. And I think that's actually something to be aware of and how we can think about our political imagination and organizing. Um, so I agree with that. I think the, the one thing, um, and, and I do think that, you know, so one thing that I would say is, is absolutely right. I think that we have these narratives that we tell about um, you know, how social transformation happens in the United States, and some of those narratives don't serve as well, right? So, um, you know, so there's the, the, the whole question of, of how we tell the story of, you know, of, you know, 
US democracy as, as being in crisis and when do we recognize it as being in crisis as opposed to it has never been a perfect democracy. I think that's one. I think the other, um, you know, in, in the book I write about a different story that we tell ourselves, which is the story about how, um, how progress towards racial equality happens, right? And it's this story that we tell ourselves that, you know, we have these kind of heroic black protesters out there and they protect they go out and they protest in the most civil manner and and that gets us to see what's happening and people are transformed and without any any conflict right we we make progress and i think part of what that narrative does is it 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 blinds us to the ways in which any kind of transformation any kind of moment is going to be awfully contested and difficult and like you said it's not going to be this easily resolved you know it's not a movie right, right. that wouldn't be neatly tied up in a bow can i say there was, yeah, go ahead. Um, there's just a great phrase that that makes me think of so so my book is bookended with songs even though you get to meet all kinds of people you might not like i couldn't stand to start with horror but also i was the, the late harry belfani uh, who I got to spend time with before he died, and and some of not everyone knows that Harry Belafonte, the Deo, the Banana Boat song, which he understood as a radical freedom song, and was absolutely integral to so many struggles, freedom struggles, and died at age 96 just recently. Um, angry and joyful, right? Angry because the struggle was long, and he hated what he called. I was just thinking, he was so angry toward the end of his life, and always had been to what he called the Hollywoodization of the civil rights movement. The Hollywoodization of the civil rights movement. That, that's when you say, when we say, did, did Obama, is this reaction to Obama? Yeah, if, if, if you view American history through a movie, and now a black president's elected, you know, um, uh, that is so prone, and he would say, look, after every great victory we had, there's always a murder, right? And he went through the whole civil rights marches and pointed out, look, here was the murder that comes after that. He called it the minstrel act of American life. Um, the way whiteness takes a struggle and, and does a minstrel act of it. So I think that is, you know, I'm interested in the ways that the writers that you're, like you're looking at Harriet Jacobs and so on, these folks who we can learn from this long struggle, what are the other narrative possibilities? I didn't mean to steal the question. No, that's quite all right. That's all right. So I want to change the subject a little bit, not really, but how social media has just exploded all of this. Um, you know, I, tonight on, uh, there, was a, there was a story about, um, oh, I can't find it, but um, Disney, Apple, and Lionsgate halted ads on X as Elon Musk's X, you know, the former Twitter, um, as Elon Musk faced a furor over his endorsement of anti-Semitic conspiracy theory on social media. You know, the, uh, the, the way uh, in which this information, whether it's real or not, hate or not, is so quickly disseminated, now really changes the landscape of social movements and the ability to get anything done. So I was wondering if you, both of you could talk about how social media has impacted you know, your work, but also the greater work that you're looking at in terms of civil rights movement, LGBT rights, women's rights. Um, so I guess the, the place in which I've thought about this the most is, is because you know, um, I write in part about the movement for black lives in the book, and I think there it's actually a positive story where people were able to use social media to mobilize and to meet each other. And you know, before Twitter became X, I think there was a, a way in which um, a lot of activists saw social media as actually really useful. I think you're seeing, um, you know, as a way to, one of the things that I remember somebody um, telling me um, about the difference um, between, let's say, Ferguson and, and, and other struggles, they were like, we were able to get our stories out. Like, we didn't have to depend on the national media to, um, 
to, um, to frame it for us. We could get our frames out there and then people had to respond to those. And so I think, you know, we've, I think because for very good reason. We worry about this information, which is rampant. We worry about the ways in which, you know, um, um, X, for example, now is 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 really um, platforming and and propagating really hateful, um, 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 you know, folks. That there was a way in which social media actually democratized the information landscape and allowed activists to really, you know, um, tell their stories in a different way. Um, and I think the, you know, the, the grief that some people feel about the loss of Twitter is about the loss of that space. Um, I think some of that is happening on TikTok. I myself am not on TikTok, so I don't know. Um, but it feels to me like, you know, um, we now forget some of those ways in which actually social media allowed certain kinds of activism. One of my students last night said to me, if you're not on TikTok, you're not anywhere because that's where everybody is and that's where everyone's getting their news, which is a little frightening. Right. Right. It really is. Jeff? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I would love to sort of speak to some of those old positive examples because I am interested in that the way that crisis language brings us in the present. And if we think back to Ferguson, if you think back to this chapter in the book about the Occupy movement right. and the political imagination that embodied, which was totally made possible in the real world, physical bodies sleeping next to each other in the park by social media. So too the Arab Spring. Both those movements crushed and defeated. And um, that doesn't mean they weren't there for a while. Um, uh, but I do think it's also worth saying is, I, I think you mentioned the so-called men's rights activists. Um, I've covered a lot of right-wing movements in my life, and um, they're always more interesting than their caricature. They have ideas, they have things that they care about, except for these guys. Um, these guys, their caricature is dumb and they are dumber. Um, I, and, and, and look, I'm not, they have doxed me, they have threatened my children, but that's a difference too, right? I used to get threats by mail. It's like, ooh, a letter. This is kind of exciting. A wow, souvenir. They put a stamp on it. Um, yeah, there was effort. There was, you know, they cared about me to go down the post office. Now that stuff can can move very quickly. And I think about, for instance, the really misogyny so central to this moment yeah. now. It is mm -hmm. it's not in addition to white supremacy, it's part of white supremacy. Uh, I think of young men that I know who are encountering men's rights ideology um, uh, that they would not, even in 2014 is yeah. when I went to that conference, there was online, but they weren't, didn't have that social media presence now. Mm -hmm. Jordan Peterson, Andrew Tate, young guy, maybe he wants to work out in the gym, so he works up, looks up a bodybuilding video, and then here is yeah. Andrew Tate, a man currently being tried for rape, giving telling you that uh, rape is a, a lie, it's a myth, it doesn't really happen. So I think um, that's the acceleration we all feel. And it's worth considering that many in the right speak of something called accelerationism. Let's speed this up, let's get to the war. Um, but maybe the resistance to that is to remember those Ferguson and Occupy and Arab Spring and to think how do you, how could it be otherwise? So do I start asking for questions now? Okay, so there are two microphones and I expect people to line up and ask questions. So do that, please. Um, you know, it seems as though fear is the, the thing that runs through all of this. Mm. You know, it's, it's the common denominator and it plays out differently based on who you are, what group you're with, but it's all about, you know, there are four, there, I call it the four uh, emotional food groups, love, hate, fear, and hope, right? And it's really, you know, all about fear and hate. Um, and so I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to how fear has been such a motivating factor in both of your books and in the people that you write about. Oh, I was just going to quote you, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
I was, I, I mean, anticipatory grievance is that when you say fear, and this is a, a term I've just learned from, from Juliet's brilliant book, anticipatory grievance and so precisely describes so many of the people I encounter. I think particularly of a militiaman in um, uh, Rifle, Colorado, and he was at Lauren Boebert, Congresswoman Lauren Boebert. Um, she built her fortune with a, a restaurant called Shooters, which is like Hooters, but the waitresses carry guns. It's open carry. And I'm sitting there, I'm having a Walk 9 burger with the militia guy, and he's telling me the Civil War is on, um, it's, it's, it's coming, and this is a man who believes that Joe Biden eats babies. He says, if they do one more thing, we're gonna be out in the streets. And I'm like, you, you think he eats babies? What's the one more thing you need? And he says, when they come for our guns. Right. And that's the anticipation. He's got his guns hidden all over town. And so that, mm -hmm. now I have a term for that, anticipatory grievance. I don't know if I'm using that correctly. No, you are. I mean, one of the things that I, you know, that I do think about is the way in which this, this idea of anticipatory loss, right? That thing that hasn't happened, but that you're so afraid of, that you're preparing for it now, and that you're taking these steps to make sure that you're responding to it, even though it hasn't happened. And, and I think that this is, this is something that is, um, is really central to the way in which people are, um, are responding um, right now and to the backlash, right? If you think about some of the attacks on education, on libraries, part of that fear is fear that our kids will think, think differently from us if they're exposed to different ideas, right? I'm not, you know, maybe some people think that their kids are being indoctrinated in schools, but I think a lot more of them are just afraid of what would happen if their kids ended up having different beliefs than they do. And so I think this kind of, and you, I mean, they don't know that, right? They don't know what their kids are going to, to think. And so it's this anticipatory, you know, um, um, grievance that's anticipatory loss, right? The sense that something is coming and I'm, I must make sure it doesn't happen by banning the books in the library and, you know, reporting the teachers and doing all the, the things that people are trying to do. And something is coming. And I think so much of this has to do with the morning, we, we were talking about this beforehand, mm -hmm. the morning of the pandemic. Um, the morning, M-O-R-U-R, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Um, the morning that didn't publicly happen. And climate grief. Yeah. That when I see a guy, and everyone know what a coal roller is? It's you rig your truck so it spews more toxic smoke. Mm -hmm. That's not a climate denier. That is a person who is passing on their pain. That is a person saying, see how much I don't believe in this? They feel the heat. They feel the heat like everybody else. And so I think some of that is, is there is something coming and it's too big to think about. So maybe it's a book called Gender Queer in my kid's library. Maybe that's the threat. Okay. Well, I just had uh, two quick questions. <clears throat> One was uh, if uh, we all Citizens United uh, <laughs> seem to bring dark money into everything. And just, I wonder how much you want to comment on that. And the other was education. I mean, it seems like we have a dumbing down of education and, and that seems to somehow, I mean, how can people think some of these things? That's my question. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll do education and you can do um, the other one. Um, so. I absolutely think that we need to think about the, you know, these attacks on libraries, on schools, but we, you know, as attacks on education more generally, but I think we also need to think about what's been happening with the public education system. You know, I work in higher education and I used to um, teach at the University of Texas at Austin and public universities, most of them now get, you know, um, in the, you know, like I think the last, when I left, which was years ago, UT was getting maybe 14% of mm -hmm. its budget from the state. It's probably gone down since then. This is true of most public universities. So I think there has been a kind of a disinvestment in education. Um, and I think that, um, you know, that it is, as well as an attack, right, if you think about the sense that like, oh, you know, the, the characters about what happens in universities and, and, uh, and how, um, you know, how, how terrible they are, I think this is all part of, of, of this, um, you know, um, an attack on, on just 
thinking about the things that we need to know to be good citizens, right? And, um, and that it really is connected to the ways in which people can't, for example, sift through um, misinformation and they, they can't, they don't really know, for example, or have the tools to object to some of the things that are happening because, because we're not teaching um, folks some of the, the, the skills that they need about the nuts and bolts of U.S. democracy. Well, I just want to say I don't know what you're talking about with the dumbing down of education, because I learned from Nikki Haley, uh, the relatively moderate candidate, that 90% of our schools, our elementary schools, are teaching a college-level theory of critical race theory. It's not happening in my kid's school. I want to know why he's being left behind. Um, but uh, no child left behind. Um, the money question is sort of, and, and I'm, I'm probably not the best person to answer that because I think in some ways that's been, um, the money is absolutely important, and, um, and I think what uh, Paul was saying about the death of newspapers, that's, you know, we can talk about the big national stories, but your local paper that is just saying money is being misspent here on, at, at the park and so on, all up and down. So I think that is part of reporting. We know how to do that. What we don't know how to do is to answer that question, how do people believe these things? And we don't do it by saying they're crazy, which is an insult to people who struggle with mental health. And we don't do it by saying they're duped. We do it by understanding that fascism has a gravitational force. There are reasons, these anticipatory grievance that people, that people uh, do that. And we can't explain it away with money. I think AstroTurf, everyone familiar with the term AstroTurf? AstroTurf is real. Right-wing groups create a kind mm -hmm. of a front group. It's real. Fake false flag uh, operations are not real. This is where the right says a mass shooting is a false flag. But I do see my friends on the left using AstroTurf the same way the right uses false flag to dismiss the possibility that any of these people really believe this stuff. It must just be the money. And if only that were so, we could, we could pass those reforms, we could repair. But um, we do have to actually contend over the ideas. I wanted to jump up and ask you a question. You used the term slow civil war and, and I'd love for you to both answer this question is, uh, friend Fiona Hill, who had testified against Trump, talks about a similar term, soft secession. And, you know, we see 65% of Southern Republicans say they want to secede from the Union, not, not a, a pretty recent poll. I'm just curious if you could paint a picture for us. What does that look like? What does soft secession mean? Why is it more real now than perhaps it was before? And what does that portend for the future of, of perhaps actual secessionist movements in this century gaining some traction? Um, I just, uh, uh, this weekend actually, was at a conference in Waco of the Texas secessionists um, who are seeking to create a one state of, of Texas. And it's, on the one hand, it's easy to sort of dismiss them as a joke. They're very anxious. How do we keep, how do we stay in the NFL? if we're a <laughs> separate nation. They've got two lawyers working on that. Um, and on the other hand, to pay attention to, and I, with being aware that I just said the money is not all, there was money there, and that was sort of interesting. And I was, but I was most interested in, in what their imagination of this, this was. And it, I think there's a writer named Sarah Jones from New York Magazine, and she sort of saying like the, the civil war that she sees now is not the blue and the gray on the battlefield, but it's almost this idea of individual secession. And um, a, a neighbor who flies, for instance, if you ever see the all black American flag, it's not the blue lives matter flag, the blue stripe, this is all black, run. That flag stands for, I believe in the coming civil war, take no prisoners, kill them all. Um, a neighbor who's flying that has already seceded, and I think that kind of antagonism, a neighbor who can uh, show up at the school board meeting and, and, and throw fists, I think that's already, that's already happening. Whether this escalates to, say, the violence level of the troubles in Ireland, I mean, I, I don't think that's yet determined, um, but I think soft secession um, is, is, a, is a, an equally good term as slow civil war. It's probably better because then people, slow civil war, they say, what are you talking about? You know, the military is not going to fight each other. Um, 
Probably not. Um, I don't have any wood to knock on, but um, uh, uh, that's my vision of it is is a little bit Orange County, Vermont, near where I live. The sheriff has already said I'm not going to enforce lots of laws. They've already seceded. Um, uh, that's already happening in the constitutional sheriffs movement around the country. Mm -hmm. yeah. Schools that just get rid of the books. We're just not going to talk about it. We can just do it. It can happen beyond the sort of the scope of cable news, breathless breaking news reporting. Anybody else? Okay, now it's time for you to ask each other a question. I have notes. For the, oh, the, 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 okay. uh, um, I'm prepared. Um, um, uh, I really do. There were so many things in the, in, in the book. Um, one thing, actually, I know we, I was going to, I have two questions for you, because one was we agree, let's talk about some hope at the end so we don't just doom scroll. Um, but there was a line, you're writing about Buffalo and the Buffalo mass shooter at the end, and you quote an activist um, who, uh, and I, let me see if I've got it here. It's about, um, yeah, black residents of Buffalo suffered from food apartheid long before a white gunman opened fire. If everyone remembers, this is a white guy who chose a black supermarket in Buffalo, a black supermarket, a supermarket that he had decided there was in a black neighborhood and had mostly black folks, and he went and killed them. Um, as one local food activist observed, there's a saying, the fork will kill you faster than the bullet. And here in Buffalo, we're experiencing both, the fork and bullet. And wow, that's a, quite a powerful way of saying that. Do you see that as a quickening, as an accelerating, the fork and the bullet simultaneously? Is that, is that making the situation more dangerous? Or is it where we've always been, just naming it? And then talk about hope after that, because that's going to be a real downer of an answer. Right, yeah, yeah no. Um, I think that's where we've always been. I mean, you know, um, I think one of the things that I, I talk about in the book is how um, we have paid more attention to um, particularly um, African-American suffering in these very spectacular moments, right? When there were lynchings, when people are being killed by police violence, but there are all of these other ways in, pe in which people are dying in really more ordinary ways because of, you know, um, you know um, they live in food deserts or their neighborhoods have more, um, you know, pollution or they, um, you know, have, you know, because of are facing disparities in access to health care and, and because of the toll that racism takes on the body, they have chronic conditions. I mean, there, but those aren't things that we, we, we haven't had a Black Lives Matter movement about those things, right? We have them about, around the, the sort of spectacular moments of violence. And so I think that, that part of the, the issue is, is what kind of violence do we pay attention to, right? What kind of, what ways in which people are suffering do we pay attention to? Um, and I think we, you know, it's easier to not look at the ordinary ones that kind of fall under the radar. Um, and I think that's what the, you know, that's why the, that's why I picked that, um, yeah. that quote, right, about the, the, the fork and the bullet, because it's, it's precisely both, but we only, tend to pay attention to the Slow bullet. Slow violence, that scholar yeah. Rob. Uh, I'm blanking as well. Yeah. <laughs> Slow violence, that term, yeah, that's, that's really bad. Mm -hmm. And the, the good part. Oh, <laughs> hope. Um, so I think the thing that gives me hope are actually young people, who I think are getting a really, you know, everybody's favorite um, thing is to talk about how the college students get everything wrong and they're, you know, but, you know, if you think about, I think there's um, about, you know, young people today, think about the, the kids from Parkland who became gun rights activists, right? Think about, um, all of the the kids who are involved in 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 climate activism i mean i think that um that there's there's a lot of young people today who are really trying to make um make the country make the the world a better you know a better place and 
Lord knows, I hope they succeed and they save the planet for us all because, you know, we, we need it. Um, I mean, and the forces that they're, they're you know, they're trying to, um, to contend with are, are enormous. And I think that um, this is not to say that, oh, on their own they will win. I mean, one of the messages that I, of the book is to say, you know, instead of looking at the, and, and simply honoring or recognizing the heroism of activists, the obligation that we have is to say, what can we do? What does that mean that we should be doing as well, rather than leaving it to them to save the planet for us or to, you know, um, to reverse abortion bans or whatever it is that, that people are being mobilized by. Mm -hmm. Okay, now it's your turn. Yes. Oh, go ahead. You didn't get it. Yes. Um, so this is, um, my question is about, you know, you've spent a lot of time um, talking to right-wing activists and you've talked a little bit about the, the incels and the, the sort of role of, of these conceptions of masculinity. Um, so how do you, how do you think about what are the ways in which we might, for example, think about, um, you know, responding to in an effective way to the manosphere and to this, you know, this, this whole collection of, of, of anger um, and fear that's, um, that's coalescing around gender. You know, as you were talking about young people, I was thinking um, this group of kids I met in Black River Falls, Wisconsin, which is far from Milwaukee or Madison or any liberal bastion. This was after Roe fell. One young woman, Maddie, goes out with a sign that says, your misogyny is showing. And she stands on the bridge and people drive by and yell at her. Local preacher comes, big towering guy. She's under five foot, screaming at her. She's going to hell. She stands her ground. And as she does so, she's joined by more and more local teenagers. Um, so that's fantastic. And that was like a really hopeful story. And they were pissed as hell. One Peyton, a cheerleader for the Black River Falls Tigers, she comes, she's like a chirpy cheerleader. And her sign says, fuck off. <laughs> and, and I say, what's that about? Just it's like, fuck off to, to me, to you, to all of us who failed, right? But saying, we have to step up and, and organize with them. But I'll say in that group, um, the group just kept growing and growing. Uh, more and more young women, non-binary folks, one uh, young gay man, not a single young straight man had mm -hmm. the courage to stand with them on that bridge. So I think that question of how we do that is a, is a central one. But it goes to the question we always come up with here, like how do we get through to folks? I don't think we do. In the same way that in my community there's a, some folks organizing against queer folks in our school library. Uh, I'm not gonna knock on the door and get through to them. They went to Dartmouth. I couldn't get into Dartmouth, I teach there. I couldn't have gotten in. They are educated, they chose those politics. They're not gonna knock on my door and say, Jeff, how do we convince you that your kid is the threat? They're not. I'm not into the conversion narrative. I'm into the build a beautiful democracy narrative. We don't have something that is attractive enough to have that gravitational pull yet. We've been so defensive. And I think, um, to me, when I, when I think about like those young guys who are drifting off to that, um, some of them are casting about and they don't know their way in. I don't have the answer for that. Um, uh, I am something of a doom scroller. Uh, I leave the answers to others, to those young people, because we failed. This room has failed, right? It has. But we can be in solidarity with those who are going to carry that imagination forward.